Well, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time it is that you're joining us. Welcome to Thrive's online service. We are so glad you joined us today. We're gonna get ready and start our service today with worship here in just a minute. If you're joining us on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, hit the notifications bell, all the YouTube things. And uh, if you're at home sitting down, I wanna invite you to stand up and worship with us. Good morning, Thrive Church. Wherever you're at, if you're on your couch, you're coming in the kitchen, from the kitchen, from the coffee, I encourage you to enter in and worship. And wherever you're at, let's let it be known that God still reigns and that he still sits on the throne. Come on. Come on, let's turn it up. We're going to sing it out for all the world to hear. Oh, 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 oh. There's love for everyone, a new day has begun, the thing to shout about, come on. So let it be known that our God saves and our God reigns. We lift you up, up, let it be known that love has come and love has won. We lift you up, up. Nothing can stop us now, no one can keep us down We found our voice again, oh, 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 oh No need for fear and shame, there's power in His name Come on, let freedom reign, come on Let it be known that our God saves and our God reigns We lift you up, up, let it be known the love has come and love has won. We lift you up, up. We lift your name up, higher and higher. We lift your name now. We lift your name up, higher and higher. We shout your name low. Come on, let it be known that our God saves and our God reigns. We lift you up, up. Let it be known that love has won and love has won. We lift you up, up. Let it that our God saves and our God reigns. We lift you up, up, let it be known. Love has come, love has won. We lift you up, up. Greater, what could save? 
about how God rose from the grave and you rivaled death. He conquered death so that we may have life. Come on. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of you. Amen. Amen. What a beautiful name it is. You know, I really love that song. It reminds me of um, a time early in my walk with Jesus when I was really getting serious in my faith and I was uh, kind of overwhelmed by it all and having a hard time understanding it. And I remember hearing that song for the first time in my house and being kind of by myself um, and really actually feeling that connection with God, like actually in my heart, really just feeling it. You know, sometimes with worship, the verses, the words really hit home. Um, and through that connection with God, I was able to get some clarity and uh, my relationship with him deepened. Um, and so, you know, worship is one of my favorite things we do every Sunday. I hope that song or the songs we sing resonate with you in the same way that they do with me. Um, and with that, 
Welcome to Thrive's online service, everybody. My name is Trent. I'm a part of Thrive's host and leadership team. We are so thankful you joined us here today. Uh, we got a great uh, message, a great series. We're actually in a unique series we're doing right now called Hot Seat, where we're taking questions from the 20 somethings in our congregation um, and just trying to apply God's word, God's value. God's message to it. And so today we have a special way of doing that. But before we get to that, I have three invitations for you. The first one is on March 14th. We are doing a 15 minute party right here in the building, right after service. Um, it's something we do on occasion from time to time. You know, we've noticed, we've seen some new people join us online, some new people join us in the building, in the seats. And the idea behind uh, these 15 minute parties is we wanna give you some context to thrive, some background to thrive. We wanna answer your questions. We wanna tell you more about us, but more importantly, we wanna connect with you. Um, so if you have some questions about Thrive, if you wanna get some questions answered, join us on March 15th, right, in the, uh, right here in the building at 1130. Um, and if you're ready to serve, by the way, we have plenty of options for you. Lots of teams to join. Um, our leaders are going to be here then, too. So any questions you might have about Thrive, join us on the 14th. Uh, and if you're only able to join us online, sit tight. I have a solution for you for that as well. Um, now, in a couple days from now, on Wednesday, March 3rd, we are doing our first Wednesday. Uh, it's a special time here at Thrive. Uh, it's something we do every month. You guessed it on the first Wednesday, uh, but just a, a you know a time to really refill your God tank, reset your week. We do it in the buildings. We also stream it online. Uh, just a little time of worship, some time of prayer. Sometimes we do a little mini message. It's awesome no matter what. So join us uh, this Wednesday, March third, again right here in the building. But we'll also be streaming that online. Um, and then on Sundays, as usual, we do One Youth. So our One Youth gathers at 6 p.m., gates 6 through 12. So I just want to give a special thank you to God for all of the work and all the movement he's been doing with our One Youth. And a special shout out to our One Youth leaders, Pastor Diane, uh, Casey, and Jenna have just been doing a tremendous job. You know, in the pandemic, when our numbers should have shrank, they grew. Um, and the kids' lives are actually changing. We are seeing baptisms happening. Parents are telling us they're seeing a different kind of kid, a different kind of behaviors at home. And some of the kids are even telling us parents uh, are a little bit different as well. So I can't encourage you enough. If we do it every Sunday, 6 p.m. Bring your kids down to the building. Let us tucker them out. Let, uh, let God give them a little blessing before their weeks get started. Um, and with that Thrive, we have come to our Connect card. So host team, I want to invite you uh, to go ahead and put the link for our Connect card in there now. Um, if you're new to Thrive, uh, hit the button for that. And whether you're new or you join us on a regular basis, I want to really, really encourage you to put a prayer request down on those. Uh, we pray over them every week, uh, usually Tuesdays, but no matter what, we're going to go through those individually. Um, so I just want to encourage you to give God an opportunity to make a move in your life. So before you click submit, make sure you get that prayer request on there. And as I mentioned earlier about that 15 minute party, if that's something, you know, you have some questions about or you want to learn more about Thrive and you're not able to physically come in the building, put that on your connect card. We'll find a way to connect with you. We're happy to, you know, do a Zoom or WebEx, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, so don't forget to turn your connect card today. Um, and now is our time to receive uh, the tithe and offering. Um, you know, and, and before I ask you for something, I want to thank you for something. Every week, people gather in this room for worship. And, you know, you, you typically see me or, you know, one of our other hosts on stage. You see the worship team. You see Pastor Andy giving the message. You see greeters at the door welcoming and seating people. And, you know, the truth is there's tons of stuff going on right now that you may not see do not see all the people serving behind the scenes. You don't see the moms and the dads and the teenagers, you know, working with the preschoolers and elementary children literally right now as I speak. You know, we're in here doing our thing and there are dozens and dozens of children learning about Jesus in a way that they can understand. You can't see that, but it's just as important. It might even be more important than what's happening here, you know, on the stage. 
Um, you don't always see what happens here during the week. You don't see the volunteers that come in to clean the building and set up for Sundays. You don't see the band practicing and giving up their time throughout the week to come and make sure this worship is something that people like me can really connect with. Um, you don't see the Thrive groups happening in the building, in their homes, on Zoom. Um, you don't see One Youth, what's happening there. Um, and that may be a good thing, honestly, it gets a little crazy back there. <laughs> uh, but you don't see the prayers, the preparation, and the practice. And you don't see just how many people give money. So all of this can happen. And the sacrifices of the single mom, the new family, the young couple, the college student, the older couple, the senior citizen, all of these people are seeing God move in their life through Thrive. Um, and if you give to Thrive, there's a good chance you do so also behind the scenes. You give online without an audience. Not everybody sees that. But it's noticed. And let me tell you, Thrive, it is greatly, greatly appreciated. We seriously cannot do this without you. Um, so I want you to know that we are so grateful for everyone who gives because you make all of this happen. Uh, the seen and the unseen. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you for making it easy for people to find and follow Jesus. And I just want to encourage you to be faithful and give. Uh, we have a few ways you can do that. You can send it in through the good old fashioned snail mail. You can text it in 84321 right on your iPhone or your Android right now. You can also give online. If you've already given online, thank you, thank you so much. And if you ever have any questions about giving, please just let us know. And so, with that, without further ado, as I mentioned, we have an awesome service today. We have not one, but three pastors on stage. Pastor Andy, Pastor Sally, and Pastor Diane are all going to be up here answering those tough questions from our 20-somethings. So without further ado, Thrive, let's get to it. Welcome everyone to week three as a part of the series of talks we're doing right now called Hot Seat, Tough Questions from Today's 20-something. As you can see, I am not up here by myself today. Uh, I have Sally, the co-lead pastor here at Thrive, also my wife, who's with us today. We have uh, Diane Jones, our children's pastor, who is up here with us today. And it's going to be an exciting day uh, because we've been taking questions from 20-somethings and their friends and really using them as a springboard into saying, what does God have to say about some of the things that are most relevant and pertinent to them in the season that they're at in their lives? And what we've discovered is that those questions are actually questions that many of us have asked or are even asking right now uh, in our lives. And so we've talked God's will a couple weeks ago. Last weekend, we talked about love and sexuality and dating. And today, we're actually diving into what we're calling quick hits. We are looking at a number of questions that they asked and went, this is good, this is meaningful, this is relevant. We want to talk about these, but we want to hit them in a more quick, short, but very poignant and relevant and meaningful impact. So we're going to cover nine questions today that we're going to speak into and have a conversation together around. Now, it's a little bit different format than what we normally do. Uh, and I want to help us sort of frame today so that we can maximize and get the most out of it that we possibly can. And so the first thing is, I want you to get out something to take notes on. You can get out your phone. If you open the YouVersion Bible app and go to live events and find Thrive Church California, you can follow along today with all of the questions and the scriptures. You can even put your notes right in there and it'll save it for you. Or maybe you just want to open the notes thing on your phone and take some notes. Um, and then when we go through the questions, I want you to stop and go, God, which ones of these questions do you have that you want to speak into my life today? Because there is 
a God who loves you and wants to talk with you and have a relationship with you. And he has some things that he might want to speak into your life to really help you today. And things like, you know, some of you might go, there's a challenge that God wants to put before you today through these questions to kind of just change where you're at. There's maybe uh, a promise that some of you are out there going, you know what, that really encourages me and I need to hold on to that because of the season that I'm in. You know what, maybe there's a principle that you haven't been following and God's speaking to you and the Holy Spirit's bringing some conviction and wants you to start a new direction in your life. Maybe there's a new idea that can change your perspective. Maybe God's pointing out something in your life that you could lay down a worry or an anxious thought that you've had that you can walk into some peace in your life through these questions, maybe answer a doubt. There's a lot of things that God wants to speak to us today in. And I want you to choose one or two or three of these questions. Go, this is what God is wanting for me to encourage my faith, to change something in me. And I want to pray for us as we begin, as we jump into these questions, to see what God can do to speak through us, through his word today. So would you bow your heads with me right now? Let's pray to start our time together. God, we come to you because all of us have questions and things we wonder about. What would God say? And we're going to ask those questions today. God, things that we're going to cover run the gamut of life-related things and family things and financial things and theological things and very kind of meaningfully, culturally relevant things that go on and things that we just wonder what God says about. And through all of those, I know that you want to speak to us today, God. Every single one of us that is tuning in and watching, God, wherever we're at, you can speak to us. God, I pray that we would have the ears to hear. God, in our hearts, that you would begin to stir something in us because we know that the God of the universe who loves us wants to help shape and direct and guide our lives. So God, would you speak to us now? God, may we come to a place where we're going, I am listening. Holy Spirit, speak. And so God, we're excited to jump into these questions and we just give this time to you. In your name we pray, amen. 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 So let's dive in. We're going to give Andy the first question. Andy, 20-somethings are dying to know, how does God impact my career choice, and how do I find my purpose in life? I think this is a really big one, uh, because they're starting out, and they feel like they've got to get it right somehow, or life's going to go off in a different direction. And so they, they, that's one kind of thing that's driving them. I think there's another thing that's really shaping how they think about things, and that's, you know, you hear this right now is find your passion, and, and you need to figure out how to live out of that passion in your life and go for that. And I think that's challenging because it really puts this sort of, if I get it right or, or I find that, then I'm doing it right, and if I don't, then maybe I'm doing something wrong. And there's a, I think God has a different perspective and thought on that. And I actually saw a quote uh, when I was listening to a podcast uh, recently on this that really kind of changes our perspective. Uh, and it was a quote by Seth Godin, who's just incredible online, uh, just kind of writer, philosopher, marketer. And he said this, uh, do what you love, which is that mindset, right? Find what you love and do it. He said, do what you love is for amateurs. Love what you do is for professionals. <laughs> and, and what a radical shift that brings to this perspective of what we're supposed to do to find our purpose in life. Because Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says this, work willingly at whatever you do. So whatever it is that you're working on, work willingly at it uh, as though you were working for who? The Lord rather than for people or even rather than for yourself. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as a reward. That means that whatever we find put before us, God wants to shape us and challenge us to go, how do I work for it as to God, whether it's maybe your first job that you're going into, maybe you're in a, a dream job, or it's some sort of maybe a dead end job that you're not loving or liking. God says this is a moment that you can work in such a way that gives honor to Him and glory to Him and whatever it is that you do, because there's an eternal impact that we're supposed to bring in any role that we do. And so God says, hey, when you're starting off and you're looking at things, consider your talents and your, your skill sets and the things that doors maybe God opens before you. And if you consider all of those things and then you go and pray and ask God about it, he's going to direct you and take you to some places that are powerful. I know that's our story. Sally was an environmental engineer. Uh, I worked in the marketplace at a consulting firm in Chicago. We asked God this really powerful question. Like, God, what do you want for our life? God, how about this thing called, you know, going in and becoming pastors? And, and ultimately, when we prayed that, God goes, hey, that's the direction I want you to go in life. But we asked him. 
considered who we were in the process, and then you trust God to lead you in your path. That's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight, he your or paths? he will direct, direct your, your path. Right. And I think that's powerful in the process of how do you find this starting off of a career choice or path? Trust God. You don't have to get it right. He will use the things you had. God used my backstory in terms of some of those things in business that really influence leading and running a small business in terms of what we do now. It's a powerful thing in her story. Uh, I know, Diane, you had something that yeah, was really good. Yeah, it's like when your passion and purpose and your job are the same, that is really, truly very magical. But... Um, I find my purpose and my passion here on Sundays working with kids. And maybe someday that will be my full-time job, but that's up to God. And right now it's not. Uh, but I love my job, and I'm good at it. And he has blessed me so much that it actually supports my passion. And, and so what I do is important. Um, and so that's what you need to remember, that it's magical if passion, purpose, and job aligns. Um, but God can use you wherever you are. And it might be that what you do supports that passion and the purpose. Uh, so just don't discount it. And I think that is whatever you do, whether it's in your purpose that you love here at church or in your career, God can use you as you trust him and go, God, I'm going to love you. I'm going to love people. And I'm going to bring that into all that I do. So that's the beginning of this first question about how you find passion and purpose. Trust God, walk with him in it, and it's going to be a powerful thing that God will do through you. So the next question really ties into that, and you kind of mentioned a little bit about what you do, and I think this is important. This is a question 20-somethings are asking, but I think a lot of people are going to ask this question, Diane, <laughs> ultimately, is how can I not be stressed out about money? <laughs> well, uh, gosh, I just want to start with just something that is uh, always true, and that is uh, remember that, that everything in the world Everything in the world is God's and belongs to him and came from him. Um, and so um, I think that we kind of want to take ownership of our money sometimes. Um, and uh, we have to just kind of reorient ourselves and say the first thing we need to remember is that everything in the world is God's. And he has blessed us with what we have. Um, and so the stress... Um, of money comes uh, when we feel uh, like it's not giving us everything that we need. And that's tough. In America, our entire society is oriented on making money and spending money. Uh, we are a capitalist society. And so our entire economic structure is based on money. So telling you not to worry about money is not helpful. Um, so I'm going to tell you how not to be stressed out about money. Uh, <laughs> we need to reorient our dependence on money. Um, and that's, again, I know as Americans, incredibly difficult, but we have to reorient our dependence on money. Uh, stress mostly comes when we compare our lifestyle and what we have to other mm. people. Um, and so we think that um, other people have it better than us, or I'm not as far along as I want to be because this person has such a nicer house or a nicer car or whatever it is. Um, and, uh, and we get stressed out. Um, but what I wanted to share with you is Hebrews 13.5, and it says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said never will I leave you never will I forsake you and so as soon as you can realize that you have everything you need when you have God um, it's going to lessen your stress on having enough money in the bank account um, and so you whatever you have God has blessed you with and look around your life and just be thankful for it. Don't look at anybody else. Don't try to compare yourself because then you really will get stressed out. Um, and the other thing I want to say is that whatever you have, you need to steward it wisely. Um, again, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, but he has put us in charge of living the life wisely. And so whether you make uh, $1,000 working part-time at Starbucks or $10,000, you need to have a plan for how you spend that money. Um, and the plan should follow a very simple path. Give, then save, then spend. And I can do a whole nother section on give, save, and spend. There are subcategories to this. Um, but the overall, no matter how much you make, you need a plan for it. And let me tell you again what the Bible says in Proverbs 21.5, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. Mm. So start early so you can build a lifelong habit of having a budget for your money. 
Whether you're making a little bit or a lot, you wanna have a plan. Um, and 20-somethings, I love to talk about this and help you on that right path. And so if you wanna uh, get together a group of 20-somethings and have me just spend more time talking to you about giving, saving, spending, and how to plan a budget, and how to be wise with money, I'd be happy to, I'll bring the pizza. You know what I mean? I'll sit down uh, with you. Wait, you I'm, said <laughs> they'll buy the pizza or you'll buy the I'll pizza? I'll buy the pizza. She's buying I'll pizza. Bring it. Right so if, if a group of 20-somethings wanna get together, and even just talk more about money and how to build good habits early. I'm passionate about that. I want to do it. I'm a professional, so I know I can help you. I think that's one of the things that's key in this process, Diane, is that uh, you'd, when we were talking earlier, is, uh, don't make decisions without getting some counsel at times. Yeah, that's, that's the other thing is that um, don't, don't be afraid to ask for help. Again, I'm a financial advisor, so I help people with their money decisions for a living. And there is no money decision that you should make uh, if you're confused about it, whether that's, you know, what should I save in my 401k or uh, more about building a budget. There's so much information out there uh, that, you can, that you can find or there's just professionals that you could ask. So never guess your way into a financial decision that can have a definite impact. Uh, don't be afraid to ask for help. I am definitely here for you and I know there's other people that are willing to help you, your parents. Uh, somebody you know uh, has kind of stable financial world. Ask for help, it's out there. Give, save, save, spend. Then spend. <laughs> then spend. Yeah, exactly. Reorient it. Uh, so that's, that's money matters for you. And uh, we usually get our first job when we're about 16, 18 years old. So the earlier you can start with this, the better. And then the next phase of life uh, is in marriage and starting a family. And so something that was on the minds of our 20-something is what is the best way to approach starting a family or parenting? So Sally, what do you think? Ah, what do I think? So many things. But I think the best thing about this question is the word approach. Because that means you're thinking about it ahead of time. Before you get there, you're thinking about what's the best way to do that. So I'm glad that somebody asked it because I know that it's on everyone's mind. And let me just start with God's way. The first approach that you need is to be married. God would prefer right. that you be married before you bring kids into the world. And then that your relationship in that marriage is in a good place. There's no such thing as a perfect relationship, but um, we, your relationship's in a place where you have a solid ground to start building a family. Some stability. Yeah. Some stability. And pray about it. I don't think there's anything in the world we should do. In fact, um, it says in Philippians, don't worry about anything, but with everything, with prayer and petition and with thanksgiving. Oh, this is a different version. That's the one I know by heart. Anyway, with thanksgiving, <laughs> ask God for it, and it's done. He will give it to you, and then beyond that, he will give you peace about your decision. So start with asking God, how should we approach this? Research it. Um, there is nothing in this world at this point that you can't research. We have an internet. I'm not saying it's all true and great and real, no. but it's, that's what part Proceed of research. <laughs> <laughs> that's what research is. But what I'm saying is do the work. Uh, we talked about that even when we had the marriage series up here. One of the couples up here uh, was such a great example of doing the work. So some of the work... Um, this is a sampling of books in Andy's office that me and Andy have read all of these books on parenting. We've, there's more books on parenting. There's probably a million books on parenting. This is your chance to hear what a lot of other people have to say. So I'm saying something right now, and you can get feedback from a lot of people, but this is a lot of people who have put a lot of time into it. It's not that you agree with everything they say, which most of it is from God, but it's that you get the ideas that will help you form what you need to do. And then um, make, make sure you're in a good financial place um, if you're not, talk to Diane. Yep. And career. One more thing to consider is, especially for the women, where are you at in your career? Um, it's not a deal breaker for sure, but when you have a baby, there's maternity leave. You're away from your career for three months or so. And then there's do I go back full-time? Do I go back part-time? If I go back full-time, who, who do I pay? How do I do all that? It's all a lot. And then um, last I would say something really important that's worked for our family is to have a vision for your kids. Mm -hmm. And I know if you're approaching it, you don't have kids yet. That's the whole point. But my point is 
have a vision. I mean, if you're, if you're shooting an arrow at anything, you're going to hit nothing. But if you have a target for what you want to go for. So, for instance, the vision that I had for our kids that I discussed with Andy um, is I really, really felt deep in my heart that I wanted to raise specifically kids that were lovers and warriors. Lovers. Nailed it. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> Lovers in that God's called us to love him and to love people. One command, two parts. That's what he's called us to do. So that's an easy one. I want to raise kids that are loving. I specifically brought, I had twins. Our first kids were twins. I specifically brought another little girl in, I remember, for babysitting. I watched someone's, my friend's kid for free. She's like, what? I'm like, yeah, I got to have another little girl with my two little girls to make sure that my two little girls know how to deal with another little, all that stuff. Put all that effort into it. And then... Uh, warriors. Um, I was kind of even frowned upon when I said this to a friend of mine once. They're warriors, but I don't mean that in the sense of, you know, fighting with people, but, um, you know, we sing that song, the battle belongs to our God, and the battle does belong to our God, but we are not to stand on the sidelines and not participate. We are warriors in that we get on our knees and we talk to God about what it is that's going on. We allow him to fight the battle, but we are involved in it. So warriors in that respect. And just that it takes a lot of internal strength to just navigate through the world that we live in today. Um, and so maybe warriors in that sense Exactly. Well. This is no easy world to get through. And I did not want kids that would be like, I love everybody, but don't touch me, world gets hard, I'm going to go in a hole. I want them to be able to stand up for what they believe in. So parents, I think this is important that we go into it with the right vision because the vision that's popular to talk about is happiness. Um, and your kids right. won't be happy if your target is happiness. Your kids will be happy if you help them discover God's purpose for their lives. Our wording, that was for us. God has a wording maybe you come up with in your family. You shoot that for your target and you cast that vision and you parent in that way and it'll be a powerful thing that you'll see happen. Because your ultimately family. you're looking for character. Yep. You're raising kids to have character. The things that you live by and you stake, put a stake in and say, this is what I believe you're God shooting has, for yeah. that with your kids. And then just four reasons, um, four things, four reasons not to have kids. If <laughs> Your parents are begging you to have kids. That's not a good reason to have kids. If all your friends are having kids, not a good reason to have kids. If you're about 35 years old, not a good reason to have kids. It has nothing to do with your age. It has to do with all these other things that we were talking about. And uh, last of all, if um, you're trying to fix your relationship, this is a big one. I hear this from people all the time. Well, maybe if we just have a baby, it's not a good way to have kids. Again, it's the approach. You approach it with God, and I promise you, you'll be on solid ground. So let's throw it back to, who am I throwing it to? I'm going to throw it to Andy. Andy, why do other religions exist? Yes, we're kind of moving away from sort of the life-related stuff and starting to move into just a question about theology and understanding. And I think it's a great question uh, because you look at the world that we live in and you see Christianity and then you see all these other religions that are out there and you start to go, okay, how does this work? How do they fit together? Do they all point to the same place? It's really kind of an interesting thing in the journey. And to start off with, I think we got to go back to the very beginning. God, when he created the world, uh, had a purpose and plan in mind, and, and, and other religions exist for, out of that process that happened. Because God, let me just follow along here. God created us at the beginning. He created us to worship. He created us to worship him. And, and, and that's what's built into us and how we are wired. So worship is a key part of it. But along with that, God also gave us the freedom to choose whom we wanted to worship because he wants a relationship with us. And relationships can't be forced. They have to be natural and a choice that we make. And so God goes, hey, I have this great life and great way of living that I want to have you and I want you to choose that. And so he builds worship into us in that process and then something happened. We chose to go in a different direction and worship something besides God. We chose to worship ourselves. We chose to put our needs and our ideas above God's. And so that fractures everything and the world kind of breaks apart and, and goes in a difficult situation. And here's what happens though. We're still wired to worship. That's not taken out of us because that's woven in the fabric of every single person on the planet. And we know this. We see this. We worship sports stars and people who have wealth, and we worship people that are celebrity. That's just something that people aspire to, and they kind of worship those types of things. 
And so it's wired into us, and so in the process, we still have to explain life. We still have to explain how things work. And so humanity decides to create gods that we worship and that we try to believe in or understand about and and to answer the questions of life. And so every religion starts off, and you start to see some vestige of truth in each one. There's some overlap with how they answer certain things. You go, wait, they all sort of kind of say some things that are the same, and yet in the end, they're not. Christianity has this incredible thing that changes because those other religions to try to give an answer to everything are incomplete, The only answer that is truly complete comes with the full truth of knowing Jesus Christ as God come to earth to help set things right because we can't fix it on our own. This is where all of the religions fall short. John 14, 6 says it this way. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. Now this at first kind of puts Christianity at odds with all of the other religions. And it does because Jesus is so unique. And here's why. All of the other religions that are out there, they have one thing in common, is that you have to work your way into some right standing with God. It's about what you do or how good you are, how good of a life you lead. And if you do good enough, then maybe God will look favorably upon you. But in the end, how good is good enough? It it, it always falls short. And God, the God of the universe through Jesus knew this. And he goes, hey, I want you to come down and do what you can't do on your own. I'm going to make it possible for you to be whole and right again through Jesus dying on the cross, covering up our sins, coming back to life and conquering death to just show in power that we can live a new life. And God goes, I'm going to make it possible for you to worship and be connected to the God of the universe again. And it seems at first that Christianity is exclusive, yet in truth, it is the most inclusive of all the religions because you don't have to do anything except confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is the way. And God goes, begin that journey of a relationship with him. And it's incredible the life that comes from that and what God wants to do through us. Jesus' way is the most inclusive, amazing way to live and why it's different than any other religion. Relig- different from ever, any other religion and also kind of answers the unasked question in why do other religions exist is how do we know that our religion is the right one? Mm-hmm. And it's the only religion in which nothing more is required of us except to believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, so all the work, uh, all, uh, all, all of any, anything that you just have to, you, you just have to accept what God is already offering to you. Um, nothing that we can do, like Humans have this great DIY. We just want to add to, add to, add to, add to everything. Um, But we don't have to. Um, We just need to believe that Jesus is our Savior, accept the grace that, uh, that God has given us to accept him as our Savior, and follow him. It is really that easy. And I think for us, then, that question at that point really does... Uh, it, it, it can be a challenge at times for young people uh, in this day and age, especially 20-somethings, um, because we just want to be like, hey, can't we all just get along, and can't all roads lead to God, and isn't that great? Um, so this next question really kind of plays into that, and the question really is, why aren't there more 20-somethings in church? Man, that's a good question, and I think that it's one that has been asked over and over again through a lot of generations, is that there's just a great falling out that happens uh, between childhood and adulthood, uh, where there's this 20-something hood. (laughs) And I think that a little bit of it is that 20-somethings are really finding their way in the world. Uh, It's a time of life. There's a lot of figuring out going on. And so you've gotten a lot of direction from your parents and your family and your friends, and they've been kind of uh, making decisions for you or helping you make decisions. And all of a sudden, now you're in the world of adulting. Uh, And now it's up to you to make the decisions. And so there's a lot of just trying out things um, and seeing uh, what, what... you know, what you want to do and what you believe in. And I actually went through that myself and I was uh, 20 years old or 20-somethings, um, is that I had to own my own faith and I had to decide uh, if what I believed was true. Um, and so it took some questions. And my parents had a vision for our family that their kids would go to church um, and they stressed the importance of it. Um, and not, not as a to-do list to check off something that we had to do on Sunday, but uh, framed it for me as a way... Um, 
that was important to my relationship with God and Jesus. Um, and so when it came time to decide if I wanted to continue to go to a church, I decided that it was. Um, I tried not to go, but I couldn't because I wanted to spend time with God and I wanted to learn more about him and going to church helped me do that. And so the first thing is a lot of 20-somethings maybe just don't have that. They weren't raised that way. Um, there's a lot of live and let live uh, raising up of children in our world today where if the kids don't want to go, they don't have to go. Uh, and there's no good reason. Just, you know, you, I don't want to force them. I don't want them to hate it. Um, and they won't if you frame it correctly. And so maybe some 20-somethings weren't raised in the church, and so there's no reason for them to go. And the other reason, if, if you say, why aren't there more 20-somethings in the church? Uh, they don't want to go. You know what I mean? They're not here because they don't want to be here. Uh, it's a fun, crazy world out there. There's a lot to do, especially in California. Good weather, hiking, surfing, um, wine, you know, all the stuff, right? Um, and so maybe the reason they're not here is because they just don't want to be here. They have other things to do. And so then it's up to, um, especially Bible-believing 20-somethings, to prioritize it. And so I'm going to take you all the way back uh, to Hebrews, and we're going to go back there and say Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. How are you going to do that if you're not here? You know what I mean? How are you going to spur one another on if you don't see each other here right. and have a meeting time to come and do that once a week? Uh, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And for me, that's all the more as you see the world get crazier and crazier. It's more important that you're connecting with your peers and prioritizing church. Um, I think that uh, in my 20s, I had a lot of opportunities not to go to church. And I, I can't tell you how many times I said, uh, I can't do that. I have I go to church on Sunday, or I have to leave something early because I have to get up early tomorrow for church. Um, and it wasn't a burden for me to do that. I still had a lot of fun. I still was able to go to parties with my friends. I've traveled. I've gone to other countries. I haven't missed out on any other experiences, and I've had the added benefit of growing my faith mm -hmm. consistently through my young adult life to set me on a solid path to get me where I am today. So I want that for all of you. And so. Maybe another reason people aren't coming is because they think church is weird or church is boring. And churches maybe haven't done a good job of creating an environment that 20-somethings want to go to. So I'm going to tell you right here, that is not the case at Thrive. I think we have done a good job. Actually, Pastor Andy, Pastor Sally have intentionally done a good job of creating a good place for 20-somethings to come to. Uh, we preach the truth of the gospel here, but it's relatable for anybody at any stage of life. And we honor and we want to raise up young leaders and we listen to you as evidenced by sitting on the stage today and talking to you. And so that when you hear your friends say, no, church is boring or church is irrelevant, you can say, not my church. I think you should come with me and, and check out Thrive. So I'm going to tell you that we've laid the groundwork for you, and we've been faithful in doing our job. And I'm going to put it back on you, our young leaders, our 20-somethings, um, to invite your friends. I'm 45 years old, so I don't know that many 20-somethings. But I know you as 20-somethings know a lot of other 20-somethings. So I am going to put it back on you and say, young leaders, you can be the generation that turns it around. So invite your friends. Prioritize meeting together. Mm -hmm and spurring one another on um, and invite your friends to thrive. That's right. And we're going to help you uh, even a little bit more. <laughs> we've heard from our 20-somethings through this. And one of the things we've been talking about as a staff actually is starting this summer, we'll have a meeting and then a kickoff. But we want to have a group in this church for 20-somethings, for people that are after high school but before marriage, a group where you can get together and you can help us lead. You can tell us what direction. And that's perfect timing uh, to have that, that group get together, learn at where they are, because another thing on the minds of our 20-somethings is how can I get more out of the scripture? So Sally, why don't you go ahead and continue on that thought? Okay, how to get more out of scripture. Let's start with scripture. Scripture's in the Bible. I highly recommend that you have a Bible. If you do not have a Bible, by the way, Thrive would love to give you one. We have some out in the lobby. Uh, we would love to provide that for you. Um, also, just to mention, there are Bibles from, for every walk of life, for men, for women, for children, for, um, gosh, my friend had a birthday party for her daughter, and she loves manga, and I said, they don't particularly go to church or know who Jesus is, but I asked, can I buy your daughter a Bible? And she said, sure, that's what you do, I guess, that's what you do. And I said, that is what I do. So I bought her, she's into manga. I bought her a manga Bible. They have a Bible for anything you can think of just about these days. So get a Bible. And another thing I want to say about that is 
um, something that changed my life is this Bible right here. This is a study Bible. You see, I have studied it. Um, it changed my life because sometimes you read the scriptures and you're like, uh, I don't understand that. That doesn't make any sense. A lot of things that happened 2,000 years ago don't make any sense. I get it. I often sat there as a teenager and a 20-something and a 30-something going, I don't get it. Got this Bible, started reading the explanations after every verse. For most verses, there's an explanation. It changes your whole world. And then... And I'm, it's available here at Thrive. And it's available. And you can borrow mine if you want to. I also have one on my phone, which I hope all of you have that too. It is very convenient to get to. Um, and then, of course, just daily. We wouldn't learn how to read a bike if we did it once every two months. It's the same with knowing your scriptures. If you get into it daily, you will, piece by piece, get to where you want to go. Um, rubbing shoulders with Christ followers. That's the whole point of Thrive Groups. That's the point of coming here on Sunday morning. And that's the point of making friends with and hanging out other Christ followers. Yep. You're not exclusive to Christ followers. That would be living in a bubble. And we don't want that. We want you to rub shoulders with the world and rub off what you've learned about God onto other people. But you, iron sharpens iron. It says that in the Bible. That means what Diane has learned rubs off on me because we hang out. What Andy has learned rubs off, off on me because he can't stop talking at home. No, I'm kidding. Because he loves it and we're passionate about it. Right. Um, and then read other books. There's a lot of other books after you read your Bible first to choose from. And I brought some of them this morning. Oh, that was my parenting books. That was for the parenting part of this. That's a sampling. These are the other books that I have found very pivotal in my relationship with Jesus and in my journey in following him. It's not always easy to follow Christ. So just a few books. Case for Christ. I've got that one. That's good. Jesus with Dirty Feet. Awesome. Love Does. Amazing. Life-changing. Love Does. He just came out with a new book. It's going to be amazing, too. Anything that C.S. Lewis wrote. He was an atheist. Yeah. He wrote amazing books. He understands God from yeah, a different point of Christ. view. So good. Uh, circle maker prayer, yes. about prayer. Mm -hmm. You want to pray about something, read this book and you will have a new attitude. Um, in, but not of, you can live in this world, but not of this world. Great book. Make a um, raising children again, kisses from Katie. This is just a simple book of a girl's story who never thought she'd be called into mission. She's went to Africa and never came back. Um, and now she is the mother in her 20s of like 19 children in Africa all by herself. Changing the world. Changing the world. Read this to your kids. It will get them scratching their heads and wondering, what am I called to do? It's a mm, great thing to so do. Good. A Tale of Three Kings. If you have trouble with people leading you or people following you, hurts. this is a book. Troubles, hurts in church, hurts in your job, hurts anywhere you go in your family. This is an excellent book, game changer. And then lastly... Um, these two books, you read these with your kids like the month before Christmas. The kids love them. They eat them up. But even more than the kids, you will love them. You won't be able to put them down. Uh, so that's a few things, how to get more out of Scripture. Um, and then I just want to put a plug in for the weekly sermons. Uh, things are explained here on Sundays. It is no task that we take lightly on what we teach your kids in the preschool, what we teach your kids, in the kids, at youth, and here on Sunday morning. We don't take it lightly. We put a lot of work into it, and we try to make it so we understand so that we in turn can have action and go do it. Um, so it's also free counseling once a week. I mean, I am with the whole process of writing every sermon, and I still sit here and take notes, and I get my notes out when I'm having conversations with people. I'm like, oh, I don't remember. But I got notes from the sermon, so let me talk to you about it. So anyways, those are just a couple ways to really fall in love with God's Word and help it to change, help, help God's Word to change your life. And then we're moving into how do... A loaded we, question. A loaded question. Ooh, <laughs> loaded. I'll let these two fight over... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> how do I navigate the current social and political climate, Andy? Uh, you know, this has become increasingly challenging, uh, and I'm not talking about recent events, although that would be included in it. This has been growing now uh, for a long time, and there's a, a real trouble uh, that's emerged in that dialogue is dying, 
uh, conversation between people is just being obliterated. Uh, my ideas now are like fixed and you're wrong because you don't think the way that I think. Uh, and so there's this huge challenge that's emerged in terms of how, especially Christ followers, people of faith, maybe you're out there and this is one of those things that is one of those barriers to faith and, and trusting in God because you've seen some things even in recent days that are done in the name of God. And it's a challenge. Uh, and so I, I want to start by just answering a few different things in the journey uh, of, of what this looks like in terms of how we are to respond and how we are to be a part of this. I'm going to read a verse to begin with. Uh, it says, Romans 13, 1. It says, everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God. That is the key phrase in this entire verse. You can highlight it, underline it. Uh, and all and that those in positions of authority then have been placed there by God. So there is a sense here that is most important that God is in control of everything that takes place. Even if it has a different viewpoint or you're from a different position than what might happen, God is in control. And we have to trust that he is in control and that he is the one ordaining and leading the process of this world. And I'm going to submit to that process. This verse, though, does encourage us to participate in the process. I'm not saying stick your head in the sand and just kind of ignore everything that goes on, because I tell you what, I love getting involved in and talking politics and enjoying kind of understanding of things and ideas. God calls us to participate in the process, but don't get caught up in the process. And there is where a lot of Christ followers, a lot of people in our world, our culture, especially here in the United States, are allowing things to get out of control in their lives in this area. Because when we become so fixed in our position that I'm unable to listen and interact with someone, because here's the truth, if God's in control, then I need to trust that because the moment that I start thinking that a political party or a political position or some action by the government is going to change ultimately things that are happening, I have some really difficult news for you. It's not going to happen. Jesus Christ is the only way that is going to change the hearts and minds of this world. I'll put it to you this way. If you're a diehard Democrat or you're a diehard Republican, guess what? You're going to die unfulfilled. I'll tell you what, for me, I'm only dying, believing and trusting in Jesus Christ, and that is it. Yes, I will engage in the process. You can have leanings and understandings, but if you don't filter what you know and trust in through God, his word, and what he calls you to, then you are going to be so frustrated and upset. And isn't that what we're seeing in our world right now? And I will speak to this, because there's a lot of people that are getting consumed by our culture right now. They are consumed with the ideas of a certain understanding or position or perspective. If you're consumed and you're reading about it and talking about it and you're watching it and that dominates your thoughts, then that's probably become an idol in your life and you are elevating that to a place of worship and prominence where God is not the authority, something else is. And the book of Colossians tells us in chapter three that we're to put to death those idols that get God pushed out of the person of control in our lives because we're looking to other things that are in control. And that is what needs to change in us because our perspective needs to be that we love first and always. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is the mandate and call of God in our lives of what he wants us to do and the power of what he wants to lead us to. And so I want to challenge us in this area, especially as Christ followers, that we're people that will have difficult, challenging conversations. There are things that God calls us to that really are powerful and strong, and yet the manner in which we do it is everything. Mm -hmm. Have strong convictions, but speak that truth in a way that is loving always in the process. That's right. There's no one political party that has the answer to everything that's going on in the world. And we can't share the good news of the gospel if we immediately place ourselves separate from others based on something that has nothing to do with what's in the Bible. Um, Jesus is the only answer for the problems in the world today. And so that needs to be first and foremost in our minds. And we have to position ourselves to be able to accept uh, and, and listen to people um, and not discount them based on something that is not in the Bible, just period, period. 
There's one more question that we want to uh, kind of tackle as we wrap up our time today. Uh, and it's a question I think that is universal to everyone uh, that is a challenge, and that is how do you learn to wait on God? How do you learn to wait on God? Because I think all of us go through situations and circumstances in our lives where we ask God for something, we want something to happen, we want it to happen more quickly in some level, and then it doesn't, and you're in this period of you're kind of waiting. It's sort of like you're circling the airport, and you're just waiting for that you know, news that you can, that, that the runway opens up and you can land, and, and we feel like that way with God and some of the things that we go through that are challenging in our lives. And, and to, the simple answer to that question is, is that it's not easy sometimes. It's hard when you're at that point of going, God, I need this right now, or God, this is going on, where are you in the whole process of this? Because we want answers, we want movement, but God has a timing and a plan. And we have to remind ourselves of that all God the time. God is not in a hurry. He's not. God <laughs> has his own timing and his own way of looking at things, and waiting is often necessary sometimes for next steps to be brought about and if we wait for God, something good happens. There's a, a, a book, uh, the book of Psalms uh, in chapter 27 says something really powerful. It says this, it says, yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness. That's a pretty bold statement there. Uh, While I am here in the land of the living, and I love this next one, so wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous, yet wait patiently for the Lord. There's a sense of trusting God in this process of waiting on him, going, okay, God, I know you're good. I know there's something that you have. I know that you have a plan, but in the meantime, I'm going to wait patiently, and that takes bravery. That takes courage to sit and to wait in the process. It's like bookends. Wait, brave, courageous, wait. <laughs> exactly, because the waiting, it, you got to be brave in there sometimes because you do. things don't work out the way you want to, but this is where it comes back to. If I'm confident in the Lord's goodness, that means I'm also, as it says in Psalm 18, I think about God's way is perfect. All the Lord's promises prove true. When I remind myself of that, even in the waiting, all of a sudden I can take a deep breath and go, God's working something out. God is doing something that's good. I am going to trust that what he has in store is even better than what I have in store in my life. Yeah, I think one of the best analogies I've heard in recent times is from a Bible teacher from a Bible study I was doing last year. Um, and it was GPS. And that when I plug an address into, if I'm not sure where I'm going and I plug an address into my GPS, what I'm thankful for is that it doesn't say, okay, Diane, you're going to go a mile, then turn left, and then you're going to go a quarter of a mile and turn right, and then you're going to get on the freeway. Okay, go, right? Because if I had to remember all that, then I would get lost and confused. And so God's like that. Um, he has a perfect plan for your life, and he has directionality checkpoints that uh, he's going to lead you through, and he's going to get you there. Uh, but if he hasn't told you what the next step is yet, that's because you're still on the path that he, that you need to be on, or else there's a realization from the Holy Spirit that maybe you've uh, taken a left turn somewhere, just like, what's God's will for my life? We talked about that, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you haven't heard clearly from God what the next step is, just like GPS doesn't tell you every single step uh, before you get to a location, you just need to wait for God to tell you what the next step is, uh, but it will happen. It does. You know, interesting enough, waiting actually has rewards. James 1 tells us that maturity, we grow in the waiting, uh, and also, we are made complete, and there's a preparedness then in the process that gets us ready for what's next. Uh, I talked to a thriver about this um, just last Sunday. We were having a conversation uh, before church, and they were talking about that they were praying about something and asking God for something in their life, and they had to wait a long time. And they got to the point where they finally said, God, you know what? We're just going to step back from this and just go, it's all in your hands. And then Sometime later, what they were praying for all of a sudden came to be. And looking back on it, because they had to wait quite a long time for God's answer to the next step to move forward, this person told me, they went, you know, I'm so thankful because I am such a different person today. I trust God more in this, and I see why the wait was there. And I think sometimes that's the hardest part is we don't always see, and yet God is doing something. So I've got three things that you can do while you're waiting. So while the wait is happening, while you're in that place of going, okay, God, I want you to move. I want you to do something. And I'm waiting to see that. Here are three things that you can do. The first one is, is ask this, what is God teaching me or showing me? You begin to ask that in the moment and it gives purpose to the wait. 
that you're not just kind of going, okay, when it happens, it happens. No, God is trying to help grow, change, teach, show you something. Or next thing, what can I do to position myself when God is ready to move? Sometimes there's some steps of things we can do to maybe grow a little better, maybe change some things in us, or, or we can take some additional steps you know, to learn something different. And when we do that, we're actually acting in a way that when God's ready to move things forward, I've done what I needed to, that I'm ready, and I'm prepared for that next step that takes place. And the last one, am I spending time in his word and in prayer? And then the big part, listening. Listen. Because if you just go, God, will you do this, and then that's it, don't be surprised if you're not talking to God, asking God, going to God, being in his word. Remember God's will. It tells you so much about the next steps about going to his word. If you do that and you don't listen, or you want to go off in your own direction, because here's the thing, we can make stuff happen. We can get stuff done and move on and get answers and put ourselves in the God seat and start driving. But God goes, we'll never get to the right destination. We'll get to ours, but God has something good for us, just like it said in Psalm. There's something really good that he has when you wait, if you're willing to wait and then listen. So when the step comes, you're ready to take that step and move forward in the process. Because waiting on God can be such a powerfully good thing because God wants to form something in you in the process. Amen. Amen. Did All we do good it? stuff. Did we solve life's problems? Was that like putting your mouth on a fire hose? Yeah. <laughs> um, what a blessing it is uh, to answer questions from God's word mm. and to be privy to what he wants us to know and to do it as Christ followers together. Um, I hope this was helpful, especially if you're in your 20-somethings and you were asking these questions. I just want to lift us up right now and pray, pray a blessing um, over this time and that God would continue to work in our hearts. So Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you've done and giving us guidelines. You certainly have left plenty of room for our personalities and, and for our tendencies and for our wants and desires. You've left tons of room for those things, but you've also given us very specific guidelines. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would illuminate to us what it is that you're trying to speak to each of us individually through uh, answering these questions that people have asked. What is it that you would have me grow in today? What is it that you would have everyone listening uh, today to grow in? God, would you just, just your grace and your mercy, thank you for that. As we stumble through some of this stuff and we get it right sometimes and we don't get it right sometimes, thank you that you are always watching and that you are always speaking. And help us, as the last thing we just talked about, help us to learn to wait on you. If that means that we are strong and courageous, I think that's a really good thing to learn to do. So help us to learn to wait, to not forget that if our steps are ordered in the way that you would have us and we learn to wait on you, we will be fulfilled in each of these categories we talked about today. So just a blessing, especially on 20-somethings, as they are comfortably and sometimes uncomfortably walking around in this world, deciding what direction to go and what to do. Would you just speak to them, God? Would you be closer than a brother, as it says in your word? Would you give them comfort and peace as they make decisions that are according to you? Will you bring people into their lives to sharpen all the things that you have taught them already and to bring them further? God, I hope that we honor you in all that we say and do in these times together, worshiping you. And I just ask that you would be lifted up. In your son Jesus' name, amen. We want to thank you so much for joining us today as a part of Thrive Online. Before you go, would you write in the chat one of which one of the questions really spoke to you today? Maybe there's a couple of them that we had talked about that said, hey, God wants to speak something strong and bold and encouraging into your life. Which are the ones that had some meaning and you really felt like God going, hey, this is for you today. We'd love to know that. So you can put that in the chat. We'd love to have the interaction together with you. Next week, we wrap up this series asking probably one of the biggest questions that is out there, especially that is asked towards Christianity. Why does God allow suffering? 
There's so many things that happen in our world and we have our own ideas about what that looks like. And I have to tell you, I cannot wait to be able to jump into you and just explore that question together with you. So we'd love for you to come back and join us next week. Make sure that you're doing what you can to bring somebody along because it's a question that so many of us are asking and especially our 20-somethings. So we cannot wait to see you next time and are so grateful that you are part of what we're doing today on Thrive Online.